everybody. Welcome to the Crohn's Fitness Food Podcast. I'm your host, Stephanie Gish, Crohn's warrior and IGA nephropathy warrior, and I'm dedicated to sharing the stories of those with IBD. Thank you so much for joining me today. Now let's get to it. Well, hi, everyone. My guest today is Flick Manning, Crohn's disease warrior, author of Living Human, and founder of Corthentic. Her career as a dancer and choreographer spanned 20 years while she lived with chronic illness. But as she shifted her focus onto her health, she developed a complete wellness system, Corthentic, and became an ambassador for Crohn's and Colitis Australia, Mental Health Foundation of Australia, and FitRec DNA. And she's here today to share her journey. Thank you so much for joining me today, Flick, and welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. This is going to be fun. I can tell already. I can too. I'm very excited. And you are, you are just a force to be reckoned with. I just finished reading your book and what a journey that you have had. It was so inspiring and just wonderful to, to read. I actually listened to it. I listened to the audiobook, So it was wonderful to listen to. <laughs> and we'll get into that in a minute. But first, as we get started, why don't you go ahead and share your Crohn's journey with us? Talk about when you were first diagnosed and, and how you got that diagnosis. Sure. Uh, well, thank you, first of all, for those lovely comments on my book. It's it's amazing when my book finds its way overseas somewhere, uh, especially being in Australia. I'm so far away from anyone else in the rest of the world, basically. Uh, so it's, it's always such a joy, and I'm so glad that it resonated. Thank you very much for taking the time to read or listen to it. Uh, and yeah, look, my journey has been really, really long, really. Uh, the first major signs of Crohn's disease, I guess, really came with puberty for me, you know. Um, while I can look back now and see that there were some of the extra intestinal issues were popping up even at five, six, seven years old, they were all spaced out far enough apart that they were treated as very individual things. So the, the real recognition of something major happening was around puberty and then the diagnosis around 13, so almost immediately on the back of that. And that was a really trying and extremely traumatic process, to be honest with you. It was not simple or straightforward. I faced a lot of what I guess even now people face uh, with an invisible disease. I wasn't believed. I was questioned a lot. I was doubted a lot. Uh, I was blamed a lot by doctors. So, you know, there was a lot of different comments thrown around at the time. Some of it was, you know, well, you're a teenage girl. This is anxiety. This is you being angsty. This is you being too sensitive. You know, you're making it happen to yourself. Like all those kinds of things were being said to me on repeat constantly. Uh, I was being sent away from hospital. I would show up in the emergency room and they'd say, she's just stressed. And then they'd send me out of there without actually doing any follow-up procedures, those kinds of things. So it was really bless my parents for kind of advocating and constantly taking me back. They were taking me to surgeons and all sorts of different people, uh, pediatric specialists and all sorts of stuff, just to try and get somebody to pay attention to the fact that something was very, very uh, not right with their daughter's body, not with me, but with my body. And uh, eventually, after a lot of trial and error, I think it may have taken from memory five or six sets of scoping and a whole bunch of other stuff to be done for them to go, oh, actually, it's Crohn's disease. And yet I knew it was Crohn's disease before I had it. I'd, I'd read all the books. I was going to the library. I was trying to find solutions because no one was listening. And uh, so I knew I had Crohn's disease before they did. How early in your journey do you think you figured out Crohn's disease before they did? Were you still a teenager uh, starting to research this or was it a little bit later that you really started to learn about IBD and think this is what I have? Probably six months into my journey. Uh, I remember we had this really, this huge, big red medical textbook in our house. One of those things that I guess your parents would go to pre-internet, obviously, days, uh, before Dr. Google, uh, where, you know, if your kid got sick during the night and you're thinking, do I need to take my kid to the hospital? What's going on? You know, you could flick through this book and get a bit of an idea of what was going on. And I remember that I would be awake in agony during the night, unable to sleep, and I would quietly go and get this textbook and I would flick through it with a torch and I would be trying to find out what is going on. Um, and, you know, school library and public library and things like that, again, not, not really having internet access, so it was all that sort of stuff to try and 
work it out. But I was quite convinced that I had Crohn's disease, yeah, probably about six months into my journey. And I raised it, I don't know how many times, hundreds of times, um, and got a varying set of responses from laughing to shrugging to rolling your eyes to being yelled at to all sorts of stuff from doctors. So people just... It almost made it worse, the fact that I felt informed and advocated for myself as a young girl. That really really seemed to grind their gears, (laughs) frankly. So, you know, I came up against all of that gaslighting stuff very early on. Um, It's not unfamiliar. I still have to do it from time to time if I'm referred to new specialists for things. It's just part of the invisible illness journey, unfortunately. Yeah. How did you live with the symptoms all those years, managing those symptoms? And then what was the doctor's first steps for how to treat it? Well, a lot of it was very much self-management. It was even early on trying to work out what I could do. I was paying very, very close attention. I guess that self-awareness was starting to happen purely because it had to. I had to work out what was going on. So I was making these sort of very extensive notes um, mentally and also physically writing them down and trying to go, what did I do today? What what has happened today? What's different today to yesterday? And I was starting to kind of work out how to track not just what I was eating but my activities and how I was feeling and all those sorts of things. And I was looking for patterns and I started to find some of them. And so that was definitely a big key thing early on was even being able to recognise that. Uh, My parents bless them. I think someone at my dad's work, I believe from memory, very quietly pulled him aside. This is when it was still extremely taboo, pulled him aside and said, um, have you heard of naturopaths? Because they knew that there was something, you know, he was constantly dealing with visiting me in hospital and all these sorts of things. The people were aware at work that he had a kid that was unwell and uh, they very quietly suggested it to me. And then they sort of came and spoke to me and said, we don't know really anything about this, but would you like to try it? And I said, yes, let's go. And uh, immediately, I mean, within 30 to 60 seconds of sitting down with her, bless her, her name is Georgia, shout out to Georgia, Um, my first ever naturopath. She was the only one that treated me like a human during that entire time. You know, she was asking me questions I hadn't been asked before by the doctors. She was looking at me right in the eye. She was paying attention. She was being very gentle, very careful with my vulnerability. And I immediately thought, oh, hang on a second, I might have some hope here. That was the first sort of little spark that maybe I was going to be able to work this out. And she had, you know, was starting to work on food elimination and working out triggers and helping to dial down some of the symptoms with homeopathic treatments and supplementation. Uh, the doctors themselves were trying all sorts of things that even to this day I can't tell you why they did them. They don't make any logical sense to me. You know, I was much like a lot of people with Crohn's disease. I had terrible diarrhea a lot of the time and bleeding and they were pumping me full of laxatives, just pumping me full of them um, without any explanation because, of course, they weren't explaining anything to me. I was taking multiple types of laxatives three times a day. So with every meal, I was basically taking stuff that was going to push it through my body and it was just causing so many problems, as you can imagine. And I was taking that for years. We're not talking small amounts of time, years. Um, And then alongside that, the steroids and things like that, they started to bring those into the picture to try and control things. So my body was just chaos. It was absolute chaos for a number of years because everything that was being done was counterintuitive. It was oh, <laughs> everything that was being put in was kind of exacerbating the issue. And I was working that out as it was going. I was going, this doesn't make any sense to me. Um, I think eventually after just sort of putting my foot down a bit more, I started to become what they like to, to you know, class as a difficult patient. That got written in my file very early on and has followed me um, because I just started saying, no, I'm not going to. I'm not going to keep taking that because it doesn't make sense. And they couldn't explain to me why I should stay on it. So I started to move away from traditional medicine because I'd just been so burnt by it and further and further towards holistic because I was seeing results and I was being cared for. And so even now I'll take steroids if I flare up, if I need to, but generally speaking, I control things predominantly from a 
holistic perspective. How long did it take you to really get a handle on your symptoms going through that holistic path and learning what wasn't working from the laxative side and the medications that weren't working? How long did that process take to where you felt like now I'm, I'm getting a control? Uh, it was a number of years. I would say it was probably four or five years. And I think, honestly, that probably would have been faster had I not been taking all of this other traditional medicine stuff because it was constantly flaring me up essentially it may have only taken me a year or two to kind of get more of a balance had that not been in the picture but what I then also learned was as your body ages and you change you're going to have to keep an eye on that like what you've relied on for two three five years is not necessarily going to work for you as you continue to progress so it's one of those things where it's never a one and done it's a it's maintenance it's sustainability it's an everyday Thing. Like there are no days off from having this kind of a disease. You're always going to have your eye on the prize to some extent. So, yeah, I, I, there's the word control for me, I guess, is probably a weird one because I don't think that it's ever really control. You know, that sort of I can't lord myself over this disease. It's a disease, right? But at the same time, there's a level of sustainability and management that I'm able to achieve with all the different things that I do. And I started to see that, I guess, the four, four to five years in. It frustrates me every time I hear patients that the medical system just fails them and it's two steps forward, three, four, five steps back. And I don't know why it's so hard sometimes that this should happen and it that it happened for years in your case. Um, yeah. It's disheartening. So talk to me about, I know mental health is a big issue that you like to talk about that you focus on what was it like dealing as such a young age as a teenager going through from hospital hospital not getting any care learning what your what your diagnosis is on your own essentially and then dealing with that mentally what was that like at such a young age look I very nearly didn't survive it that's the truth I really came very close to not surviving it you know, and I talk about this very openly because I think it's something that doesn't get talked about enough. So trigger warning to anyone <laughs> that is listening. It's going to get dark for a second. Um, but, yeah, look, you know, I I was very close to ending it. You know, I'd made a plan. I knew what I was going to do. I'd written the letter. I had the whole thing lined up. I had a particular date that I was going to do it. And it just was this weird delivery by the universe that, that naturopath appointment and my first appointment with a counsellor happened within the two weeks prior to the date that I'd set. Now, if neither one of those or either one of those hadn't happened, I probably wouldn't be here. So those two things just kind of landed exactly when they were meant to. And I suddenly had, and it was a very small spark of hope. It was not big. It was very small, but it was just enough to get me to think outside of where I was currently at and to realize that maybe I wasn't the problem. I wasn't causing all of this to happen to myself. I wasn't some kind of burden. I wasn't like all of the language that had been placed on me. Maybe that wasn't actually to do with me. Then maybe that was more to do with the world and the medical system and nothing to do with what I was experiencing. And so that sort of made me realize, number one, that I could stay in the world, but secondly, how important mental health was actually going to be for me in this journey it really highlighted the power that your brain that your mind can have over your body and so it was a weird thing because I had to grapple with I'd been told a lot that I was stressed and making it happen to myself so there was a lot of denial of wanting to even recognize that mental health could be part of the picture because I didn't want to even consider that maybe I was making any of it happen to myself and I know now that I wasn't but I knew that my mental health was then exacerbating some of the symptoms because I was so upset and I was scared and I was frankly desperate. And when you're in that state and the people that are authorities are blaming you or shaming you or both, that's a really precarious position for your mind to be in and then that just makes everything in your body so much worse. So, yeah, mental health became a really, really big issue early on and I'm very glad that the counsellor that I met, he treated everything very holistically as well. And so, you know, I had got to the point where I couldn't verbalise anymore what I was experiencing. Um, and 
it's escaped me now, which is the joy of brain fog, but there is a term for that. I think it's con- contextual muteness, I think is the term for it. But essentially, yeah, when I'm in a pos- was in a position where I had to advocate or talk about my symptoms or situation, I wouldn't be able to. I just literally couldn't operate my mouth at all. And so he helped me to work out how to do those things with putting toys in sand pits and creating dioramas and really like using my creativity to start to channel those things. And he taught me tapping and a couple of breathing techniques and things that, again, no one had ever, they were not part of my world. No one I knew had ever done any of these sorts of things. So he was bringing these tools into my world to try and, you know, journaling and all sorts of other stuff was starting to happen. And that really was a really important thing. But it's not as though it got easier straight away. It actually got harder straight away, you know, I would have to say, because it was all coming out. Everything had to come out of me that had been bottled up for a long time. So it got pretty dark for a while and I was seeing a combination then of psychiatrists and counsellors and then I was being put on medication for my mental health, which also had effects on my body. So it was this really big balancing act of all of that stuff going forward. Uh, But then it also made me realise how many people around me actually had mental health issues that were undiagnosed and untreated and unrecognised. I think once you go through it yourself, you automatically can feel it just being around another human being. So it's something we all need to be very aware of. And how did you find that person? Was it through the naturopath? So interestingly enough, even though I was being told by the specialists over and over again that it was in my head that I was making it happen to myself, not one of them ever put me in touch with any kind of counselling, mental health service, anything. I think my GP at one point suggested that I should be going on an antidepressant and that was probably because I think my parents had recognised I was in a very, very bad way, which I was, um, where I stopped verbalising things and, you know, I mean, I looked like the typical angsty teenager. I wore all black. I wore baggy clothing. I was wearing dog collars. I was like... I looked like a, you know, like I was a gothic kid, even though I wasn't into anything gothic. I was just, I was sort of shrinking behind this thing. And I think my parents were like, oh, panic stations. Um, So they were trying to kind of work things out as well. But my naturopath had suggested that going to see a counsellor rather than necessarily a psychologist or a psychiatrist at first might be a gentle way to bridge the gap. And As you can imagine, my parents were spending a significant amount of money in the medical system and also in the naturopathic system. Like we all know it's not cheap if you go to a naturopath and they couldn't afford much. So it was my naturopath that suggested that um, I go to the YMCA counselling service. They had a service here in Australia where it was significantly cheaper. I think it was $15 per counselling session. And it was just a case of whether or not they could fit you in. And so my mum called straight away and I was just so lucky, his name was Andrew, that he was available and off we went. So, again, it was really probably through her that so many of these pathways opened up and became a possibility. We didn't know that any of this stuff existed or that we could access it at all. Um, All we knew was that what they had told us in hospitals and stuff, which was you know, quote unquote, which is what one of the doctors said to me, you're sick in the head and you need to work it out. Wow. So <laughs> that was about as much care as I got in the hospital system. Um, so thank, thankfully for the naturopath that, yeah, that, that sort of opened things up that we just didn't know were even there. What are some of the top things that you've learned throughout the years working with the naturopath and the counselor? You mentioned a little bit like the tapping, some of the different methods, but that in addition to kind of diet, the holistic approach, what are some of the top things that you found have been most beneficial in your journey to get you to a point where you are so successful in so many things in life that you're not just sitting at home, you're, you're out, you're doing things. CEO, you're starting companies, you're writing books, you, you are living life. So what has helped you to be able to do these things? Yeah, look, I, 
it's probably not any one thing. That's the truth. I mean, it's a very, very long journey to get to where I'm at today. And there's still things, of course, that I struggle with and I have to work through. It's As I said before, it's not a one and done. It's an everyday maintenance situation, whether we're talking mentally, emotionally or physically for me. Um, but I think a huge part of it was developing a really extensive self-awareness. And in doing so, I was able to start seeing that a lot of the labels and the words that were applied to me, whether it be through my physical symptoms or what I was experiencing mentally or emotionally, that they were words that had meanings that didn't make any sense to me. They were meanings applied to words by able-bodied people that didn't have any of the same experiences as me. And so none of those words really could sum up who I was or who I felt that I was meant to be. And once I got past the initial, I guess, grief and shock of that recognition, recognising that the world was not designed for me at all, was that I could then create my own world. It sort of freed me up from thinking I had to fit into the perfect box and to pick the one career and to pick the one type of thing and to think, no, I can kind of do anything as long as I'm self-aware enough to recognize when I need to change course, when I need to prioritize my body, when I need to make adjustments, all those kinds of things, then really anything that I want to do, I can do. It's just a case of maneuvering all those pieces. So I sort of think, you know, most people, if you think of us like a jigsaw puzzle, they've got a 60 piece jigsaw puzzle. Great. I think when you've got bodies like ours and over the journey of our lifetime, we become like an a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle. And so part of it is learning what all thousand of those pieces are and where they fit so that you can actually put the piece of the puzzle together. I think the benefit of that is that we get a broader experience, I think, in a lot of ways. We we become more emotionally aware, you know, like we're painting with more colours (laughs) than the average person a lot of the time. And I think there's a lot of there's a lot of power in that. So I think what it came down to was recognizing I wasn't going to get that from anybody else or the world or any structure that existed. That was going to come from within me. And so by developing self awareness um, through self care, so they kind of came as a package journey. So working out what my body could do, working out what my mind could do, work out what emotionally I could do, those things really created enough self-awareness that then I felt empowered to be able to just move through the world and go, you know what, I'm, I want to write, so I'm going to write. I want to go on radio, so I'm going to go on radio. I want to start a company, so I'm going to start a company. It was not sort of I did a successive three different things. It was just this long journey that eventually developed that self-awareness and then the empowerment that comes from that. So I can't imagine myself ever doing one thing. It's just not. You know, it's, I just can't imagine actually just being kind of stuck in a bo- one little box and saying, well, that's what you have to be for life. Because I just think we don't know how long we're going to be here for. And if there's something inside you that you want to try, then try it. It doesn't matter whether it fits anybody else's perception because they're not you. They don't live inside your skin suit. They don't live inside your mind. They have absolutely no idea what your experience of life feels like. Only you do. So really you get to dictate that. So I think, yeah, don't don't worry about what other people are saying or even if a doctor tells you you can or can't do something in particular, spend the time working out what, what it is that feels right for you and then chase that. Just keep on chasing it and don't stop. I love that. So let's talk about food for a minute, because that's something I always love to talk about. I find it so fascinating that so many of us have the same disease, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, this IBD, but food is so different for every single one of us. So Mm. you mentioned earlier that you were starting to write down things, journaling early on. So what did your diet look like back then? What does it look like now? And does diet play a role in your overall wellness at this point? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, Yes, diet has always played a really significant role and it is definitely different in some ways than what it was early on. Uh, When I first began to kind of eliminate foods from the diet, I think gluten came up first as being one of the, the things to potentially remove. 
Now we're going back over 20 years ago. So it wasn't as though you could just walk to the supermarket and get gluten-free bread and gluten-free biscuits and whatever else that, you know, is readily on the shelves in a lot of places now across the world. So it was a case of really like you remove something and there wasn't something to replace it. So, you know, you are really making a huge change to your to your diet. So when we removed all of that kind of stuff, I was basically left with brown rice. That was kind of it. There, there was no other alternative. So I ate a significant amount of brown rice. I ate it hot. I ate it cold. I ate it in porridges. I ate it every imaginable which way that you can think of. And, and my diet was extremely small and extremely limited. You know, I can pretty much recount for you exactly what I would have had on your average day back when I was a teen because there was only like half a dozen things in the entirety of my diet. I ate brown rice. I ate broccoli. I ate um, rice milk, again, with brown rice. <laughs> very exciting. I ate chicken, very plain steamed chicken. Um, and my mum worked out how to make a little coconut sort of cookie. There was no sweetener or anything in it. It was coconut and I think some egg white sort of mixed together to make it fluff up in the oven. And that was the closest I could get to kind of a sweet food. And that was the entirety of my diet. That is literally all I ate. Um, and I know that for the, at least the first two years, that is all that I ate. There was nothing else in my diet at all. Uh, the, no pepper, no salt, nothing. Very, very plain. So even at school, we would I would take a, like a little cooler bag and it would have brown rice and steamed broccoli and everyone else would be eating their sandwiches and their pies and their like whatever and I'm sitting there, uh, you know, all through the year eating my brown rice and broccoli. So very, very plain, very limited because basically anything I put in came out. That's just the truth, you know, like it was one way or the other or both. Like it was <laughs> like everything was being rejected. So those were the only things that seemed to kind of pass through semi-okay. And then eventually we we worked out um, going through a bunch of different health stores. There were some alternative breads. Now, in the end, those ones also didn't work for me because they had other things in them that, that, as it turns out, that I couldn't have. It wasn't just gluten. But, you know, um, we started to kind of work those things out over time. And, again, that tracking was absolutely essential to work all of that out because otherwise truly my thinking was, well, this just there's just nothing like I'm just I can't survive on this planet because there is literally nothing on this planet that I can eat, and it's very easy to get into that thinking to feel that there is just it's just impossible. But tracking really helped me to work out that sometimes it wasn't what I was eating; it was the way that I was eating it. You know, was it because I had it steamed instead of pureed? Was it because I had it as a soup instead of baked? Like those things, I had no idea that there could be a difference in the way that my body was interpreting that until I tracked it all and went, oh, okay, I actually can have that, but I can only have it in that way. And so those things helped me to work out like a much bigger food, you know, list as I've gone. But I guess the other thing along the way is that, again, as my body has aged and changed and as like a lot of people with autoimmune diseases, I've gathered other autoimmune diseases and other syndromes and things along the way. Once our genetics are open, they, you know, things happen over time for a lot of us. And so then my, my diet has had to change to adjust to the symptoms that those present or the ways in which foods, you know, then that I could have before. Well, now that I've got this new disease, that's now actually a trigger for that, for that disease. So I've then had to kind of work those things out. And again, that tracking has been absolutely fundamental in that. Uh, and there is every single day I am, I think through my food, not just for the day, but what did I have yesterday? What did I have the day before? What have I got coming up in my schedule over the next few days? Like what do I need to have my mind, my body, my emotional self primed for? And the decisions are made accordingly. And I learned to do that really from my late teens and early 20s, I would say, and that has followed me through life. And that will be part of my life forever because it does change my capacity uh, to do things. It just really, really does. You know, I just can't afford to stick just any old thing in my body or to not think through, you know, what nutrients and, and things that I've been having in that few days prior to that to that point. Yeah, makes yeah. sense. Tracking is such a huge benefit for so many people. I did it for years. I wrote down every single thing I ate, every single, mm -hmm. single thing I did. 
stuff that went in, what came out <laughs> for years. So yeah. beneficial. Yeah. What are what are some of the things you've learned over the years as you've managed IBD? Are there any tips or tricks you've kind of learned to do in order to manage flares as they've come up throughout life? Mm-hmm. Yeah, look, again, I think these are I think it is very individualized. I think everyone's got their own sort of little system that works for them. Uh, and again, I think, you know, that tracking, that self-awareness, that being so into self-care really helps you to develop what those things are. But for me, you know, if a flare is coming up, or you get like the red flags that the flare, the flare is impending. And again, it's, this is one of those self-awareness things or self-care things that comes is you start reading your body two, three, four days before the flare actually hits. And sometimes you can actually prevent the flare from coming altogether if you treat yourself accordingly, sometimes not so much, and but you can track where it's kind of going to go. And so you just start putting those things into place. And so for me it might be dialing down sort of activities that I'm doing, things, you know, again, like a lot of people maybe cancelling and rescheduling things and going, all right, body's giving me red flags, I need to build two or three days of space here and trying to push those things out as much as I can. It's being extremely clear on that that nutrition and really reading the body like, all right, am I, am I got really loose stools? Do I need to kind of tighten things up and slow it down? Or is it, you know, how am I feeling in terms of that, adjusting the diet accordingly? Um, again, really thinking about that sort of nutrition and sp- reacting I guess for to the very specific red flags that are coming up you know is it that you've got like mouth ulcers and you know those kinds of things is it your skin that is showing up that's really irritated is it that you've got massive fatigue that's hitting you is it joint pain so it's like it depends on kind of what it is as to kind of how you react but it all becomes about being very gentle very methodical very very kind to myself and I think that's you sort of almost have to forcibly put yourself into this like kindness bubble and just say everything that I do for the next however many days or weeks it is, is purely that. Nothing else matters because nothing else is going to get done until this sort of calms down enough anyway. So there's no point in kind of focusing on that too much, worrying about that too much. It's what can I do right now that's going to dial down the discomfort as much as I can, because I'm not going to properly eradicate it, but what can I do to just make it slightly more comfortable, but with that eye on to get me through this phase, like that bigger picture of what do I need to do? And so keeping stuff in the house, always having supplies in the house for those it's happened, I need to react kind of situations, lots of beautiful gentle stretching, lots of breathing exercises, um, heat packs, ice packs, you know, the, all of those kinds of basic self-care things, but also just having them available to you, like having them close by you, having them in the bedroom, designing your space according to the fact that you are going to have to do these things sometimes. Like if you need to lay down in the middle of the day, can you do it without light affecting you? Like if you've got an eye mask, you know, so all these tiny little basic things, just having them all there and ready to go and, um, just that experience, I guess, over time of working out what it is that works for you. But it is, it's kindness. <laughs> it's just so, so much self-kindness. Well, speaking of self-kindness, I know being kind to your own body, fitness was such a huge, is, I believe, still such mm-hmm. a huge part of your life. You were a professional dancer for so many years. And mm-hmm. I know from reading your book, at one point you'd mentioned you really had to make that decision of how much dancing can I do? I need to put my body first. I need to put my health first. Talk to me about your fitness journey and what, where you were, what was, what that was like to, to realize I need to make some changes to care for my body and then what that looks like now. Sure. Yeah. It's look, it's definitely been a very long journey in that way. I was always a very physically active kid as well. I mean, it was one of the things that my parents definitely did I think was just make sure that we always were doing activities you know there was always something like we had no time to become badly behaved children (laughs) because we were always enrolled in something there was always classes in the evening our weekends were packed with stuff now what my parents didn't instill very well was resting 
and they're not people that rest, okay? They're people that push through. So there was kind of pros and cons to that. I definitely learned to kind of push, push myself, go harder, do everything, you know, that sort of thing. So there was an element of that that I needed to learn or to unlearn is probably more the point in the journey was I needed to be able to include physical fitness, but I needed to do it in a way that was kind for my body and understand, I guess, really the biggest thing that the chemicals that our body releases play a fundamental role in absolutely every aspect of everything that you are as a human being. That chemical highway is everything. So when I started to really invest in that knowledge about my neurotransmitters, my hormones, my endocrine system, how that affected my immunity, all of that sort of stuff, I started to really see that it was a bit like traffic lights. You've got green, you've got amber, you've got red, and to kind of recognize which one I should be in at any given time. And so exercising is great because you get those good chemicals and, you know, they're addictive. They like who doesn't love some endorphins and dopamine? It feels really good. But what I recognized about myself from that upbringing of go, go, go was that I can over-exercise. It can get to the point where I just won't stop exercising because I just want to feel good. I don't want to feel in pain. That's a really natural thing, right? And sometimes for, for us especially, if you are in a lot of physical pain, exercise is that great conduit to relieving that temporarily. But what I needed to recognize was that exercise by its very nature creates inflammation. That's part of the body's process in terms of getting stronger. You know, when you use a muscle, you tear it a little bit. That's part of how it grows. So there is this whole process going on inside where you sort of temporarily degrade in order to upgrade. And so... The, the, the issue with our bodies is that, it, you know, it, inflammatory is at the beginning of our disease. <laughs> so inflammation's already there and you've got to be very careful about how much inflammation you put your body through in addition to that. So I started to work out over time that I was actually doing some exercise that was causing too much inflammation and then not enough time for me and steps, techniques to help me to dial down the inflammatory response that was coming from that exercise. So I started to kind of work out, well, maybe I can't do four to eight hours of dancing every day and then also go for a five or six kilometre run and also do an ab workout and also, you know, this was kind of the mentality of I was going, going, going. So once I worked out, well, maybe we don't do quite so much. Maybe we're only going to do four hours of dancing and then we'll just do some stretches or we're not going to do any physical activity today and but tomorrow we're going to pick it back up. Those sorts of things, I, again, with that tracking, started to be able to work out what is my body doing? How is it responding? And one of the key giveaways for me really was that I would make myself uh, more susceptible to other illnesses. So if I over-exercised or I ignored the inflammatory response that was happening as a result of moving my body, I would end up with every cold every gastro, every, you know, every bug that was going around. But when I pulled back and I paid attention to that inflammatory response and I started to adjust how I was moving my body, that dialed down significantly. So that was a really big eye-opener for me that actually I could have some semblance of management with my alongside my immune system if I also managed my inflammatory response. So moving body, absolutely key, really important. We need it for everything. But... We also don't want to be inflamed the whole time. So, again, kindness. (laughs) So much kindness. Yeah. (laughs) Well, talk to me about, I want to talk about Corethentic because I know Mm -hmm. your journey has been so long. And as you learned to be kind to your body, as you learned how to manage living with IBD, you ended up going back to school to learn more about the mind and the body. So talk to me about that journey and how that ended up becoming Corethentic and what that is? Yeah, so again, a great question. Um, and unfortunately, again, not a short answer. <laughs> it's, a great, it's a long winding journey. Um, look, a lot of the study that I've done has come from the basis of, of not being able to get the answers that I felt that I needed to be able to manage my disease and to then therefore manage my body. Um, no one was talking to me about these things, you know, talking to me about neurotransmitters or inflammation or my immune system even. It was all 
very kind of light, over-the-top stuff. If I asked questions, I would really get a lot of pushback. They didn't really want me to be particularly informed, which I found very strange. Um, And I also found, even as a kid, I found it very strange that we didn't really learn much about our bodies. Like we were prepared to go out and get a job and earn an income, but not to live inside our body or to live with our mind. And so I became very curious and recognize well if I'm going to work this out again I'm going to have to work this out myself number one and secondly there's got to be more information here than what I'm being given I just was convinced that there was more than really what I was being told so I started to kind of invest in that education and you know became qualified as a personal trainer and then did a whole bunch of additional types of education alongside that so you know like spinal rehabilitation and you know working with people in uh, sort of different types of pain and those kinds of things you know I wanted to really understand everything about the core muscles of the body I wanted to understand everything about the lumbar I wanted to know how the endocrine system worked like it was just such curiosity and the more that I learned about one area the more that I could see that it connected to the next and so then it was just like, well, if I've learned about that thing, I'm going to need to learn also about this thing because those two things work together. There's no point in me only having half of the information. So I would get and go and study something else. And then it came to the brain and it was like, oh, okay, this is we can actually adaptively do things with the brain. And, you know, I'd been a big believer in mindset. I read a lot of books about mindset. Uh, in Alongside the mental health journey that I was on, it became about really keeping my focus on what I could do trying to shut out the voices of doctors, world, society, everything that had their labels for what I was and what I should be doing and shouldn't be doing. So I had to work out again, how do I craft my own mind to to be kind to myself and to unpack a lot of that sort of PTSD and trauma that had happened to me as a kid. And so a lot of it was just that investment and how do I do this myself? How do I work all of this out myself? And again, I think the more that you know, the more perspective that you end up having. You know, the more that I was studying these things, the more that I could see it applied to other people. And I guess it was really highlighted for me when I was working in more of a traditional gym setting as a personal trainer. This is, again, after kind of my dance career and and everything had occurred, that when new clients would come into the gym, if there was any word of, illness, disease, pain, you know, they, the rehabilitation, they would get sent to me as the personal trainer. Like you work them out. These Again, these are complicated, the difficult, complicated people. We don't know what to do with them. And so I sort of was getting sent all of these people um, who to me were not complicated at all. They were just human beings <laughs> because I knew what that was like. But it was such a joy to me to be able to work with them because I could see that they, much like myself, were struggling, had no idea what they were supposed to do with their bodies, felt a little bit like they were a ball that was just kind of being chucked to the next person and the next person and really not really getting any answers. And I had all these tools that I already had from dancing and from all of the journey that I'd been on and then all the study that I was doing. And I started to be able to kind of slowly introduce bits of that and just educate people a little bit like just drop in a little bit of information about well this is why you might be feeling like this and asking them questions again that they hadn't been asked before and you know they were then starting to pay attention to like oh okay this is what I feel like in the evening and these are the things that I am eating and this is what I'm doing and they would report those things back to me at the next session and so I was getting this clear picture of you know cause and response and all of that and the more that I did it and the more people that I saw from all these different backgrounds that I went this is huge why is nobody talking about any of this like why why do I feel like I'm the only person talking about this surely there's got to be more people out here and then I guess the fire that was lit under my bum was when I had devised all of these techniques and I was working with clients and they were getting results they were feeling better, they were feeling stronger, their immune system was coping, they were seeing improvement in things like in spinal cord movement and things that they had not had for years. And so they were having these big breakthroughs and it was bringing hope for them and all that kind of stuff. And I think they just felt listened to, which is a really big one. 
And so I went, oh, all of this stuff works. Started to devise this system based off the results that I was getting with people and the results, of course, that I'd already been getting with myself and was putting that together. And then I thought I could run this as like a group fitness class and I could make it using dance as a conduit because it's fun and people don't realise when they're dancing just how good a workout they're actually getting. And then I could just start to slip through that educational information as part of it, that I'm up there and I'm talking to them about this and I'm demonstrating things and I can be explaining to them all the things that I think that they need to know that they're never going to get told anywhere else. And so it was like, oh, I've got this idea. So here I am thinking, all right, I've got, I'm being sent all the difficult, complicated clients. I'm doing really well. People, people, other people around the gym are starting to try and copy the things I'm doing. Cause of course I don't look like a normal, I'm not huge and muscly. People don't think I'm strong by looking at me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm using equipment in ways that don't seem normal you know I'm really doing my own thing in the gym I stood out massively in the gym and so but they were impressed by that seemingly so so I would then go up to the managers and say I've got this idea I think it could really work and I would pitch it to them no now pitch it to them in a different way no okay let me take the off-peak class times no okay let me try this no And I was going, I don't get it. You keep telling me my stuff is good. You keep telling, you know, you keep on complimenting this. You keep sending personal trainers to watch me to learn how I'm doing different stuff. You know, like I'm I'm growing my, my personal training clientele faster than anybody else. Like I don't get why you're saying no. And then I went up again and kind of pitched it, pitched it harder. And then finally one of the managers turned around and essentially said to me, like, this is not going to work. You cannot have a disease and be the face of a fitness business. It's it's not going to work. Like no one's going to come to that. It's just there is no place for what you're doing in the fitness area. And I was just like jaw to the floor, dumbfounded because it was so counter to all of the things that they were already saying and all the proof that they already had. And then I went, oh, ableism. Got it. Okay. This is what we're dealing with. It's got nothing to do with what I'm doing. It's their thinking. It's their inherited bias. It's the way things are set up. And then I went, oh, I love it when people tell me I can't do something. I'm going to go and do it. (laughs) Hence, that was all kind of born from there. And I think, again, it's just that probably came from all the stuff with doctors early on and just being kind of um, a family where we go and we push and we do all those kinds of things that I think just eventually when I got told that it wouldn't work, I was like, well, watch me. (laughs) And so I went off and I made it work. So it's one of those things where I was really happy, um, even though my business model has probably changed a lot anyway, it's sort of I don't really operate in the same way as what I used to because of COVID coming along and all those sorts of things. But one of the things I'm really proud of having achieved with Core Authentic was at the early stages of the pandemic hitting and we were in really hard lockdowns here in Melbourne, like we had at the time the hardest lockdowns in the world and we'd been in it for a really long time. The YMCA Australia, again, the same people that had provided me those essential counselling services, I built kind of a, a network with them and they were putting together you know, at-home fitness programs that people could do during lockdown. And I was able to actually do a partnership with YMCA and bring Core Authentic to people that way to help provide them that mental, emotional and physical fitness and well-being that they weren't going to be getting because I knew so many people were struggling um, just with the isolation and, and the fear and all the other things that were going with it. And so that felt like a really full circle moment for me to to be able to partner with YMCA when effectively that was a big reason why I was still alive in the first place. So yeah, yeah, it felt really good to do that. That is cool. What a very full circle moment, as you said. So let's jump over and I want to talk about your book now. So Living Human is your first book and it sounds like you're working on a second one, but talk to me about when did you decide that I need to write this down? I need to share my journey. What compelled you to share what you had been through? Uh, I'd been having some conversations with my husband actually about 
you know, my, my journey, and generally speaking, and all the different education and things that I'd learnt along the way. And I'd done a lot of writing when I was younger, partially with all the journaling uh, that I was doing as part of my mental well-being and my emotional well-being. But I'd also done a lot of creative writing. I was very good at English. I won the English award for my like graduating class and all this sort of stuff. So writing was always sort of something that was something that I wanted to do. I def- a lot, other than being a dancer, I had dreamed about being an author even as a little kid. I was that kind of precocious sort of kid that would rock up having written a book over the weekend, you know, a book meaning, you know, 10 pages when you're eight or nine years old. And I would bring it in and I would bring it to the librarian and they would pass it to the principal and they'd be like, oh, wow, you know, and I would just do things like that. That was just kind of, you know, oh, I just want to do it, you know. That was just my attitude, I think, even then. So writing had always been something that I wanted to do and then through those conversations with my husband it was like this is something I I really, really want to do. And it was just kind of a weird thing that as I started the process of just starting to kind of nut out what what that might look like, I had a couple of different books that I could have written at the time and sort of written out different versions of what those two things could be. And then sort of publisher kind of came along into my life and I had a couple of meetings with them and they said, if you could write a book, what would it be? Write, a, write an outline of it and show it to us. And so I wrote an outline and which was kind of ended up being living human and they snapped it up so it was just a kind of crazy thing that happened like in my head I thought well I'll start writing the book and then it's probably going to take me a couple of years to write a book and when it's ready then I'll I'll go and shop it around and I'll try and you know it wasn't like something I was thinking I should do this right now it's like I'll work on it in the background while I'm doing everything else and then the universe kind of went no no do it now (laughs) (laughs) and so I did and it all happened really yeah, very, very quickly. And it poured out of me. Like it was so ready to come out. I didn't even realize how ready it was until I put pen to paper. Yeah. I mean, it's basically the journey of of your life. Reading through it, it was your, from your diagnosis. And then as you were growing into an adult and moving to California and learning from entrepreneurs and then coming back and starting your business and just your life changes, it was an incredible, incredible book. Thank you. Talk to me now. What is your second book is The Mind Symphony? Are you Mm -hmm. currently writing it? Is it finished? Tell me about what that is and what we can expect with that second one. Sure. Um, So The Mind Symphony is definitely a book that's very much about mindset, but with the lens of also having some of that juicy neuroscience, some of that real world applicable self-development, you know, juicy stuff that we love. Uh, It's all about things that are going to be sustainable and attainable for people. I guess it's kind of the slightly more the other side of things that I learned through that journey and developed and the education that has come from that. But really looking at the fact that the world is full of people that are all trying to work out how to human. They're all trying to work out how to human the best they can. But one of the things we don't really get taught about much in the same way as our body is we don't get taught much about our mind. You know, the only time it really comes up is if we are quote unquote struggling or we find ourselves with a mental illness at some point. It doesn't really get talked about much beyond that. You know, a lot of the time people just say, well, just be positive. Well, what does that actually mean? How does, how does that happen in the brain? How can you create that? But I also am really going to be going into the journey of how that does connect into the body, how it is a two-way street, uh, and how our mindset is created by so much more than just what we are born with, that it is so much of what the world is around us and then how we can craft that to create that kindness, that space inside, or effectively to build that harmony in our brain so that we can take on anything that we want to take on. So, yeah, I'm partway through writing it now. It's all coming out very nicely. So I'm very excited about getting that book out. And although it won't be, you know, a memoir per se, it's still going to obviously have that lovely lens of my lived experience, but making it a bit more applicable to a broader audience as well. And when do you expect it to be out for people to be able to purchase it? I'm hoping 2024. 
All right. Does. <laughs> <Those cuts. laughs> it's right around the corner. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know it's coming. It's coming for me very fast now. <laughs> Your second book now. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. Come on, university. You know you I just said it. <laughs> so we have we have touched on a lot of topics um, going through your journey. Is there anything that we have not talked about or any final thoughts that you want to share with the people who are listening? Uh, look, I feel like we've probably touched on a bit of all of it, and I'm very thankful for that. I know that my journey is very wide and diverse and all those kinds of things but I guess the final thing that I would want to say to people you know if you are somebody that is living with either Crohn's or colitis please know it's not the end of your life it might feel like it at times but it really isn't this is such alongside the challenges which there will be many I'm going to be blunt there will be many there's just part of this kind of a journey but there is so much beauty and there is so much empowerment and there's so much education and there's so much empathy. You will move through the world, I really think, as a kinder and more fully rounded human being based off having had this experience. So it's not all a loss. It's going to benefit you in so many ways. And over time, my hope for you is that you'll work out how to leverage the gifts that come with the package and uh, that's going to make your journey profound absolutely profound so hang in there know that it's possible and there is a whole world full of people like us and you know what we love helping each other so don't be afraid to reach out to somebody on social media drop them an email whatever it is probably the kindest bunch of humans I've ever met come from our community so you are supported you are safe you are seen you are valued you are heard that is a beautiful message thank you So if people want to follow you, keep up with what you're doing, learn more about all of the different projects that you're involved in, where can they find you online? Well, you can, the sort of the one-stop shop, I guess, is my website. You can go to flickmanning.com. That's Flick without a K, just so everyone knows, F-L-I-C, manning.com. You can also find me, obviously, on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. You know, I occasionally pop up onto TikTok. (laughs) So you can jump on there. And that's also got all the direct links through to my books. It's got things through to podcasts, to my radio show, et cetera. So you'll be able to find all of those things from all of those platforms. Perfect. I will put as many of those as I can into the show notes so that people can just click on them and, and jump right to each one of those. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. It has been an absolute pleasure talking with you today. So thank you for being on and sharing your journey with us. Oh, no, my pleasure. Truly, it is my pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time and for reaching out and supporting my book as well. It really means so much. I'm so, so stoked that it's made it all the way to the other side of the world. Absolute joy. So, yeah, I hope that um, everyone continues to follow your podcast as well because you're doing the good work. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you love these interviews and want to support the podcast, visit my website at Crohn'sFitnessFood.com where you can browse my featured products page to shop the companies I love and support. Make a donation using the Buy Me a Coffee link to send a little love or grab a copy of my book and IBD story, Crohn's Fitness Food and My Rocky Road to Health. If you have an IBD story that you want to share, send me an email at story at Crohn'sFitnessFood.com. And always remember, be strong, be grateful, and keep going.